Good morning, and thank you for attending the 2020 Sunstone Digital Symposium session 211 titled Gaining from Grief, Living in Gratitude. The audio from this session will be available for purchase at sunstone.org after the symposium. The video recording of this session will be available in the Whova app for the remainder of 2020. Please type any questions that you may have into the Whova app, and they will be addressed during a question and answer period at the end of the session. At Sunstone, we are making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is, there is more than one way to Mormon. We invite you to help us build a community where all paths are given space to be better understood. Please support us in our mission by making a donation and subscribing at sunstone.org. In this presentation, we are going to learn, as human beings, we are bonded by one common thread. We all go through seasons. Grief and gratitude are examples of such seasons, and how we adjust to and learn from the seasons will determine who we become and whether we will be able to accomplish our God-given purpose in life. I'll take a second to introduce our speaker before we begin. Dorica Carter is a certified John Maxwell speaker, leadership trainer, and life strategist. Her transformational speaking and coaching strategies help people who feel stuck and unfulfilled in their jobs get clarity and discover the ideal career path that makes them feel fulfilled so they can live a life of purpose. Her philosophy is, our mind is the most powerful weapon that we possess. Through it, we can create our realities and shape our own destinies. I'll now give the floor to our presenter. Thank you, Dorica Carter. Go right ahead. Hey, 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 guys. I am super, super, super excited. Can you see me? Let me make sure you can see me. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I'm super excited. This is my first time actually, um, this is my first time being a part of Sunstone Symposium. And let me just say this, I, all week I've been like, okay, this is happening Friday. Can't wait, can't wait to jump on. And you know, as fate would have it, whatever you are going to talk about, whatever you're going to, to, mention or to bring forward you're going to be tested on it so i too was tested on it god knows i was tested on it so i'm, I'm thanking you for taking the time to be here with me this morning <clears throat> excuse me we're going to go through i'm going to share with you a little bit about my experience with grief and gratitude let you in on my personal journey my story what i've been through what i'm going through currently and how i you know been able to with the help of god of course turn things around and doing what I'm doing now, which is a speaker and life coach and leadership trainer. So thank you again for joining. Now guys, a few weeks ago, literally, let me know if you can see me clearly. A few weeks ago, literally two weeks ago, excuse me, I was tested, like I said, on this particular topic, dealing with grief. And I'm gonna tell you what, the, what actually happened, but it, brought me to a place where I had to realize, okay, now let me see, Dorica. Let me see if you're going to walk out what you're going to talk about. Let me see if you're going to put those strategies, those things in place. Let me see if you're going to practice what you preach, so to speak. So two weeks ago, I was home and I got news from my husband that, you know, a baby's on the way. Baby's on the way. And now this is something that wasn't news per se, because I know a baby was already on the way and it's not my baby, okay? It's somebody else's baby that he fathered with somebody else. And over the last couple of months, I've been trying not to face that reality, trying not to deal with that particular situation, but now it was right there in my face. At this point, there's no more hiding. There's no more trying to pretend like it's not happening. There's no more trying to ignore what's, what's taking place. I have to face it. And once I decided to face it, and I said, okay, I'm gonna open up and deal with this issue. And let me tell you, the pain that hit me was so great. You know, I instantly felt numb. The first, the first inclination is to get numb. I, I, I numbed. 
because I didn't want to experience all of it. It just like a, a, a wave. And I was trying to, to kind of brace myself or to protect myself somewhat. So I went numb. And for a minute or two, I tried to shift my mindset from what I heard to what I really wanted to think about, what I really wanted to focus on, where I would like to be in that particular moment and space, but it didn't work. And so I spent days going through the cycle of dealing with the hurt, dealing with the pain. And I, I spoke to one of my um, spiritual advisors and they said, Dorica, you knew this was coming. It was, it's been nine months. You didn't deal with it till now? I said, no, I didn't. I didn't deal with it till now, but now I have to deal with it. And then once I begin to deal with it and embrace that this actually is happening, there's no way around it. Then I realize, okay, this too shall pass, right? I'm going to get past this. I'm going to be okay. So I want to let you know, whatever it is that's happening, you're going to be okay. And that takes me right into what I want to share today about grief and gratitude. You see, grief is not just unique to me. I'm not the only one who has been through something. I'm not the only one who is going through something. I'm not the only one who is, has experienced some type of loss, some type of deep hurt or pain that puts them in a place of grief. But the key, and this is something that I want us to focus on, is everything happens. And if you heard the song what, that I was playing in the background as you join in, it, the song was saying, Lord, I thank you for sunshine, thank you for rain, for joy and pain. And it says disappointment happens for a reason, right? It comes with a lesson. And that's the lesson that I want us to, to, to pick. We want, I want you guys with me to pick out the lessons that we can learn through the painful, through the grieving moments of our life. So it's not really for us to figure out how to get out of this pain. How can we stop it? But how can we gain from the pain? That's what I want us to talk about today. So let me go ahead and I know my screen is sharing. I'm going to stop my video and I want you to, um, the slides that I have prepared, I'm going to just go through them with you, right? So again, um, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for today's topic, grief and gratitude, because these are all seasons that we go through, seasons of grief and there's seasons of gratitude. And we have to know how to navigate through each season. There are multiple seasons we're going to face. But these two particular ones, I find that these two particular seasons are going to be more frequent than other seasons. We're going to have seasons of drought, seasons of preparation, but this particular season, we're going to go through a few times in our lives, okay? All right. So to the next. So I did share a little bit about my personal story just now, dealing with the pain. Um, pain, it, again, is not unique to me. We all experience it from a child who may fall on the playground and, you know, bruise their knee to an elderly person who feels pain in their joints and their bones when they move around due to old age. Pain is new, not unique to me. And each and every one of us is gonna have that moment where life is gonna happen to us. Things are gonna take us off guard that we didn't plan for, that we didn't expect, that when it happens, we, we don't even know how to navigate it. We, at some point, we feel like it's too much for us to bear. It feels almost overwhelming at first. And then the first inclination we have as, as people, right, is to figure out, okay, I don't want to experience this. How do, we, how do I get out of this? How do I stop this? How do I move from this? How do I put this behind me? But I'm going to help you today. It's not for us to do that, right? No one can escape it because it's a part of the human experience. Pain is necessary, right? Pain is a necessary process. And it's a part of the human experience. It's not for us to try to figure out how to get rid of the pain, but how can we gain from our pain? How do we pick up the lessons? How do we pick up the nuggets? How do we grow from it? How do we learn from it? How do we utilize the painful experiences, the challenging experiences that we've gone through in life or going through to make us wiser, to make, you know, to make us stronger, to grow, to help somebody else? You see, the story I shared with you just a few minutes ago, this is a story that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a week ago, I was sure I wasn't going to share. It happened two weeks ago, and I'm like, I'm not going to share this because this is still current for me. 
it's still painful for me. Even now I'm talking about it. I can't tell you I'm over the pain. I still feel it a little bit. It's there. But then I know what lesson, what lesson am I supposed to get from it? What lesson is this circumstance here to teach me? And once I begin to look at it from that perspective, I begin to notice a few things within myself that I can learn from it, a few things that I can shift, a few things that I can really gain from this. And I'm a leadership trainer and speaker. So aside from the leadership aspect of, of dealing with pain, there are the life aspects as well. What happens to pain if left unchecked? right now pain and grief and i say pain instead of grief because pain grief is unchecked pain right and this is what it's saying when someone goes through something traumatic right when they go through something very difficult for them to handle they experience great pain which if left unchecked can result in grief so grief is the result of pain that's left there undealt with unchecked right? Not talked about pain that's left there to fester over some time. It turns into grief and grief is deep sorrow. So it starts off with just a little pain that you feel, right? It starts off with a little pain that you feel. And then once the pain is left there because you're trying to ignore it, or you're not trying to deal with the pain, it goes deeper. It goes into your soul. It gets deeper. And then once it's there unchecked, it turns into grief. And then once grief sets in, now you're in deep sorrow. Now, the first time I've dealt with grief, now you may think the story I told you before was, was it, but no, the first time I dealt with grief was seven years ago. Seven years ago, my, my younger brother, he's the last one. He's actually the, the baby of our family. He's my mother's last child. Is my brother, Kemar. I was home one morning, my mother and I, and I just had a baby. My baby was a few months old and we were home and we got the, we got the, a call early morning. I think it was around 3 a.m. in the morning or, or 4 a.m. in the morning. And normally, you know, when you get a call between 2 to 5 a.m. in the morning, it's normally never something good, normally. So we got a call. Five, about three o'clock in the morning, my mother got a call from Jamaica saying, hey, Kemar was just shot and killed. When she got the news, I wasn't in her room, but we lived in the same household. I was in my room. And then she called me and she said to me, your brother just, just got killed. And when I heard it, it as if the numbness comes again because you know instantly you want to feel pain so numbness comes over me again and i and i try to to scramble through my head to try to figure out okay what did i just hear let, let it make sense to me let me try to make it all make sense and then i called my sister because i still have sisters and brothers in jamaica and friends so i call my sister and i'm like i just heard that kimar was killed is it true and she said yes i said where are you i said how do you know she said because i'm right there i'm standing right now by his car, I'm looking at the car, riddled with bullets, and I'm looking at them taking his body away. And then when I heard that story, and when she told me that, I hung up the phone. This was somebody that we shared a love of business with. This is, this is the youngest one of us, but we spoke months prior to that about starting a business. We, we spoke months prior to that about taking my youngest daughter to jamaica to see him you know he called me say sis i haven't seen you in a while what happened you forgot about me and i'm like no i haven't forgot about you i've just been busy i'm planning to come down this christmas and take my kids so you can see my little girl ariel because she was just a few months old that's the when i come we're gonna spend time together we're gonna catch up and she and he was like yeah i'm looking forward to it i can't wait to see you Moments before I got the news, like when I say moments, days before I got the news that he was dead or he got killed, I was at home. We were having Bible study at home. And somewhere along the line, I kept feeling the urge. I kept hearing, call your brother and tell him you love him. And I swept it away. And then an hour or so later, I got the same urge, the same drawing, if you will. Call your brother. 
and telling you love him. And at that point, I kept wondering, why, why is God telling me to do this? Why do I feel the need to call him and tell him that I love him? And I meant to do it, but I never got a chance to do it. I was so busy with everything else going on in my life that I didn't do it. And so when this news hit me, it was almost as if, oh my God, it's my fault. Probably if I'd call him a couple nights ago, like I was supposed to, I could have said something to him that would have caused him not to get killed because he was killed coming home from a party with friends. It was an ambush. He was in the car sleeping when that happened. I felt like I had some type of responsibility to him and I didn't because I didn't call. So I felt the loss of that. I felt, I felt that, and thank God, you know, people who came over to our house after that came, they had a vigil, they, they encircled us and they prayed for us and they hugged us. And, and for that moment, I felt the peace of God. I felt like a big warm blanket of love just come over me. And I knew at that point, God was saying, you're going to be okay. I'm going to be here to help you through this. So you see, when, when you feel like you're losing something permanently, Whenever you feel like something is being taken away from you for good, the first reaction is to feel grief. Grief that you're losing this thing. Grief that this is now gone. Grief that this is no more going to be a reality for me experiencing this person or this thing. It's no more in my, my, my presence. It's no more in my hand. It's no more in my influence, circle of influence. It's gone. I cannot never get it back. And according to Mayo Clinic, um, they say that grief is a natural reaction to loss. And most people, that's when grief sets in, when they've lost something. So these are some examples of loss that we can go through. You know, an ending of an important relationship, like a marriage, like I told you about my marriage, right? That's one example of a type of loss where grief can set in. A job loss. And this is a perfect thing for what's happening now with the COVID virus where nations are being affected so many people have lost their jobs over the last three four months because of the covid virus they have no other source of income they have no other way to make a living no other way to take care of their family and friends this was they had one job and because of everything shutting down they lost that job and now guess what grief may want to set in you can experience grief through um through the loss uh, theft or the loss of independence some people you know if they lose their independence and they feel that they have to depend on somebody for everything they may experience grief you know disability if they mean an accident they may experience that i'm by day and i say this by day because i'm a speaker and coach but by day i have i'm a licensed claims adjuster for the second largest company in the u.s that's progressive so i deal with accident cases all the time and i see people who as a result of an accident may come out disabled. They may have something happen very, very traumatic to them that affects them. And one thing that I always remember is that this person never experienced this before. This is new to them. So they may get, get in grief. So grief can come through various different ways. And these are just some of the examples. I'm sure there are other examples out there, other ways or other things that you can think about that can cause it. But these are some of the ones that I know that are um, that I could think about. But it's when you feel like you're losing something. And what are the effects of grief? So you see, grief is an emotional, it's an emotional response. It's emotional, it affects our emotions, so of course. Anything that happens to us in our bodies, there's an effect, right? So what are some of the effects of grief? The pain we feel during moments of grief can also affect us physically. So I know that the most times when we talk about grief, we talk about the emotional aspect of it, the hurt, the pain, the disappointment, the feeling of losing, and it's all about the feeling, right? It's all about emotional. But did you know there's also physical effects of grief. There are physical effects that can happen to you as a result of this grief. Now, there's a famous doctor. Um, I don't know how famous he is because I don't know if you've heard of him, but his name is um, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Excuse me. And he's a neurosurgeon. He wrote an article for Everyday Health Everyday Health is an online medical newsletter, right? And he, he wrote an article for that. And in the article, um, 
he called it how grief can make you sick right so when i was getting this ready and i'm like you know what there must be something out there that i can use to say hey this can happen physically too. I, I saw this and I'm like, how grief can make you sick? If I saw that article anywhere, anywhere, I would definitely want to read it because trust me, I would want to know what can happen as a result of me being in grief. And I, and I, and I chuckle when I um, see it too, because I'm like, it can make you sick in both ways. It can make you sick physically and it can make you sick to you like sick. I'm like, I'm so sick of this grief. I want it to be done. So it can make you sick in more than one ways. But the ways we're going to look at today is the physical aspect of grief, right? Now, this is what I'm going to read to you. It's not on the screen, but I'm going to read it to you what he says about grief. The emotional impact of grief is often described as heartache or heartbreak, right? We can all relate to that. It feels like our heart is breaking. It feels like we're having a heartache. I know when I got that news two weeks ago, that's how I felt. I felt like my heart was breaking into pieces. I felt the pain of a broken heart. And that's how we relate it. That's when we, when we speak about it, that's what we say out of our mouth. I'm hurt, my heart is breaking, or I have a heartache. And this type of, um, this type of reaction, or this type of experience, it releases the, you know, the stress hormones. It releases stress hormones that are associated with grief. So when we experience it, they release stress hormones in our bodies that actually cause cardiac problems. We've heard people say, okay, don't get too hyper, don't get too angry, don't get too emotionally, you know, um, don't get too emotionally charged because it can affect your, your heart. Grief also does that. Grief can affect your heart, it can cause actual cardiac problems. And I didn't know this. I thought only anger could cause cardiac problems, but come to find out, so does grief. And I brought this on the screen to show you this, this picture of how emotions can harm your body. And of course, there are different emotions on here. There's anger, there's grief, there's worry, there's stress, there's fear. These are the common emotions that we go through in a given day. We can actually go through each one of these emotions in in matter of minutes we can go through all these in five ten minutes we can go through all these in 20 minutes we can experience all these emotions in a in, in a specific time frame but for the purposes of this we want to focus on the grief i want you to take a look at the grief aspect where it says grief weaken your lungs did you know that i didn't know this Grief actually weakens your lungs. And it does make sense because if you've ever experienced hypertension or if you've experienced, um, what do you call it? It's hypertension, but the, uh, like a, people say they're having a nervous breakdown when they have, when they hear some news and it, it affects them to the point where they feel like they want to hyperventilate, it affects your lungs. You can't breathe properly. You have to take, you know, you start getting short breath, short shortness of breath, and you have to take your time and, and regulate your breathing by slowing it down and inhaling and exhaling. Those are things that I had to practice. Those are things that I had to learn how to, to incorporate in my daily routine, how to breathe because of what grief has done, has been doing to me. Daily, I take time and I breathe. I take deep breaths in, and then I exhale at a count of six and I do it. And once I do this, it helps me to regulate my breathing and it helps me to relax, to calm down and to, to, be, to feel much better actually. It helps me to release the stress that I feel, the, the, the anxiety that I feel. It helps me to just release any tension that I may feel in my body at that moment. This is the emotional aspect of the grief. The physical now, it can turn into an actual heart problem, which I'm sure none of us want, right? Absolutely not. Now, there are five stages of grief, five. There are five stages of grief when I was going through this and, and, and putting this together that I found. The first stage is denial. Remember I told you that I didn't want to own it up. I didn't want to face the facts. I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to deal with the news. So the first stage is denial right? 
And of course, denial is the biggest obstacle that I have found personally to moving forward and healing. And why is that though? Why is denial the biggest obstacle? I, and this is my belief. I believe that it is the biggest obstacle because when we are in denial, right? It causes us to suppress our true emotions. It causes us not to, to deal with the issue at hand. And of course, we know when we get a cut and we don't deal with the cut, we don't treat the cut, we don't look at the cut, we don't, we don't take care of the cut, it, it, it's left there, it festers. It doesn't go away, it just festers. That's what denial does. So denial allows you now to ignore or to pretend like this isn't happening, so you're not dealing with the real issue. And you're suppressing your true emotions. And therefore, denial will keep you at a place where you're stuck, you're stagnant, you're not moving forward. So that's the first stage. The second stage that we go through is anger, right? anger i'm angry why did this happen to me why me of everybody else why me not that we're wishing this on somebody else but we would wish it wasn't us right why is this happening to me why why me god why me why that's the next question that most of us ask why right but let me say this it is you who decide what type of life that you will live. The anger is going to want to set in and you're going to feel it. You're going to feel angry. But do not let the anger sit there. It's up to us to determine the type of life that we live, whether it be a life beaten down, right? Filled with anger, because anger turns into bitterness. Bitterness turns into resentment, right? And then resentment can turn into fear. And all of this coupled together can just breathe emotional instability. If you've ever seen somebody who's emotionally unstable, check them. Look at their actions. Look at how they act. They go through a phase of these emotions, anger. When you hear them speak, you can sense it. You can hear it. Anger, resentment, bitterness. And the root of all this pretty much, though, is fear, fear. Fear, fear of dealing with the issue, fear, fear of facing it. Fear is the root of all of that. It's up to you. You can choose to live a life filled with joy, right? The opposite of all that is joy, happiness, peace, right? You can choose to feel and embrace the love of your family, our friends, God, whose love is always there, present, waiting for us to to receive it because it's always there you know it never goes it's for us to receive it freely it's a free gift we can't receive any of those good things once we're in anger and according to dr cindy trim and dr cindy trim she's a, um, a wonderful pastor she's one of my um, mentors by far and i say mentors by far i have not met her in person but i read her books and i follow her on youtube and she said this is where healing begins and that, my friends, lead to wholeness. Once you allow the, 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 the joy and the happiness and the peace to get in, that's where true healing begins. This, the third stage of, that we go through when, when we're dealing with grief is bargaining, right? We start to bargain. We, we start to, to say, okay, um, if, you, if I had a choice, you know, I would prefer to deal with this or I prefer to deal with that. I've been there. I, I've said it recently. Like I would, if I had to choose the problem that I'm facing right now and not to choose it, I wouldn't choose it. I would choose something else. If I could choose the shoes that I could wear, if I could choose the life issues that I want, I wouldn't choose this. I would not choose it we start to go through the bargaining, right? We start to go through the bargaining. And then we go through depression and acceptance. So we go through the bargaining, the depression sets in, and acceptance comes after that. So these are the five stages. 
And right here, I had a little breakout session that I want us to do real quick, not too long. I want to say for, I want to give us like seven minutes, five, seven minutes. And in this session, I want to ask, I want to pose this question. I want you to take the time and I want you to answer it. And it says, what's one thing you can do to maintain your peace of mind during grief? What's the one thing you can do to maintain your peace of mind during moments of grief? I want us to take the moment to really to, to have a breakout session, which means I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quick. Unless you guys want to see it some more to, to really answer the question. It says, what's one thing you can do to maintain your peace of mind during moments of grief? And at this point, I want to hear from you. Whoever wants to share, um, let me see how many people are on it. There's eight of us on there today, so we can all, we will have the time for every, every person to share. Let me see. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me go back. Okay. All right. So let me would stop you, share. Let me come back on my video. Would you like me to allow them to speak? The yes. attendees. Okay, I'm gonna do that. Everybody, if you want to talk, I'm gonna unmute you. So uh, let's see if we can do this. So this is our breakout session, guys. What's one thing you can do to maintain your peace of mind during grief? What have you done before that worked for you? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll say something. Like, um, Who's that, Dallas? For me, the thing that's worked for me, uh, I'm, hi, my name is Dallas. Okay. Hello. Uh, one thing that's worked for me is to meditate and try to stay present and then meditation helps you get from denial to acceptance. I think you're, I don't, I don't know if you're finished speaking, but you're, you went back on mute. You said meditation, you have meditate. I heard that you said meditate is what you do, which is good. That's an awesome strategy. And that's an awesome practice. And you said something after that. I didn't hear you. Oh, sorry. Meditation helps you uh, move through the stages from denial to accept. Awesome. So meditation helps you move through the stages from denial to acceptance. That's good. Yes. So that's one thing that you've done that works. Awesome. Anybody else would like to share one thing that they have done um, that somebody else may have not tried or didn't know about that they have done that maintain their peace of mind during grief? You know, one more, one thing that you've done. This is our breakout session. This is, a, we're going to have Q&A afterwards, but this is just a quick five to seven minutes where we're going to just look at that and explore it some more. I think the hard thing for me, this is Benjamin Schaefer, um, is this idea in my grief that something worked. I mean, nothing seems to work permanently. Um, there's grief isn't something just to escape i guess is what i'm trying to say it's like uh some things work for a little while mm -hmm. but nothing um makes the grief just go away or disappear um and okay. so i mean it helps to have it helps to have a responsibility it helps to have loved ones I, I feel like um, having the support of community matters so much um, to me, but of course that's, uh, it, and it's not necessarily to have somebody to say or do anything in particular, just to have someone to be with it makes a huge right. difference. Okay. I completely understand and I can relate to that as well, Benjamin. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? What have you, what have you done? during your moments of grief 
that has helped you to maintain your peace of mind? All right, so I think nobody else, that's it. Okay, perfect. So that's fine. We, we, we heard from you. So what I've done, and this is something, what Benjamin says, um, I, I'm going to touch on that and kind of move with that as, as well. There are a number of things that I've done over the years that has helped me, that I still do to maintain my peace of mind. And there's no one thing, there's no one thing that I can say, um, this is it. There are a number of things that I've done. For one, what has helped me is I journal, right? So I journal a lot. I write things down. I like to write down my emotions. I like to write down what I'm feeling, experiencing. So journaling helps me to maintain my peace of mind during moments of grief. Excuse me. What also helps me is also being around family and friends. You, you don't want, the moment you, you find that you're by yourself a whole lot, you think a lot about what you're experiencing. You try to, somehow your mind wants to stay on it. So when you have things, like you say, have some type of responsibility, whether it be a project you're working on, you know, job, friends, you want to have people around you that can make you laugh. People that can, can you know, bring a smile to your face. They can feel the love of these supporters, these people, these friends, your family. That has helped me deal with grief that maintain my peace of mind. Because... At some point, there was not enough journaling that I could do, and I just needed to laugh. I just needed to, to not think about my issue, but to laugh, and that helped. And then for me, too, I love prayer. Prayer works for me. Like I do meditation as well. I meditate and I pray. So I do those things, and these are the things that I have done and still do to this very day that helps me to maintain my peace of mind, right? Now, when we talk about the steps, so... We've gone through the experience of grief. We've gone through the, the, the side effects of grief. Now, how can we gain from it? How can we move forward from it? Now, what steps can we take to overcome and living this fulfilled life that we're promised, that we know is, is there, that we know we can do? The first step, like um, Dallas says, is you have to accept it. He says meditation help him move from denial to acceptance. The first step is to accept it. For me, I didn't want to accept it. I had to accept it acceptance, right? Don't allow yourself to make believe it's not real. Don't live in denial. Like I mentioned before, I lived in denial for a while. I didn't want to accept it, but I had to accept it. I had to come to the realization this, this was happening. This has happened and that's it. So that's the first step to recovery, as they would say, or first step to healing or first step to overcoming this. The second step is to take responsibility for our lives. Benjamin alluded to it somewhat. I have some type of responsibility. Take responsibility. And I'm coming from the, the aspect of, okay, whether or not you could have changed situation, it doesn't matter. Whether or not you had anything to do with it, it doesn't matter, right? When difficult things happen in our lives, the more we blame people, the more we give our personal power away. The more we blame a thing, we give our personal power away. The more we say it's because of this or that, the more we give our personal power away. It's up to us to take responsibility to say, okay, this may have happened to me, but I have a responsibility to myself now to get better, to get whole, right? I have a responsibility to my children or to whomever is dependent on me now to move forward, to move forward with this. You decide now, I'm going to allow the healing to begin. I'm going to face it. I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to do what I need to do. And I'm going to take my personal power back. I determine the type of life that I want to live. It's up to me. That's how you take the responsibility. The third thing we have to do is we have to, um, and this, excuse me, this took me a long time to get, and I'm going to admit, this took me a very long time to get. And I think one of the reasons it took me a long time to get is because I didn't really understand. I've never experienced anything like that before. And when it happened, I really didn't know how to navigate through that. And you have to focus on you. I, I spent years taking care of my, my children, my husband, um, director of the, the church uh, ministry, the youth ministry at my church. I was a full-time employee, a full-time student. I had so many things juggling. I took care of everybody else and I would leave myself last. 
So I had to shift that and I had to focus on me. Now, focusing on you doesn't mean you're being selfish and it doesn't mean that you're ignoring everybody else. It just means that you're going to give yourself what you need. You're going to give yourself what you need. I'm talking about being self-aware of who you are, what you're going through, what you need in the moment. I'm talking about practicing self-love. I'm going to love me. I'm going to take care of me. I'm going to heal. I'm going to, I'm going to do what I need to do. Self-love is the most unselfish gift that you can receive, that you can give yourself. And self-love doesn't mean self-love doesn't mean that you hate anybody else, right? Um, it doesn't mean that you put people down so you can feel better. It doesn't mean that you don't serve. It doesn't mean that you don't give. It just means that you're taking care of you. It just means that you're going to take the time to give you what you need. You're valuing yourself. You know, the Bible tells us that we must love others as we love ourselves. How are we going to love others as we love ourselves if we don't even take time to love ourselves? So you first need to love you, love yourself, focus on you. That's what I had to learn. That took me the hardest to learn, but I had to get there. And 2015 was a turning point for me. 2015. In 2015, of course, young mother, we were what? Um, we were five years in because we got married in 2010. So 2015, five years in our marriage, my baby at the time now was two, two years old, going on three. I have an older daughter. Um, she was seven, seven years old. And now here I am thinking that, okay, everything is going to be okay. We're good. And then my husband says, I don't want to be married anymore. I want to go. And we separated. He walked away from our, our marriage. And at that point, I found myself broken. I found myself homeless because I didn't have any money saved up to get a place to live. I didn't have anywhere to go. I had family and friends. But you know, when you're going through certain moments, you don't want to really impede. You feel like you're bothering somebody. Or are you going to impede on their space by going there? So I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't have any money saved up. I had a car. You know, we had just two, uh, two years prior moving to this new place. So many things I had bought. I decided to give everything away. And I had to figure out what was I going to do to take care of me and my kids? How was I going to do that? But everything else that was happening, I had to, to figure that thing out. And I couldn't see myself as a single mom. I just couldn't. My whole world was built around my marriage and my husband and my kids. So when that went away, I went deep into depression. And it was my mother and my pastor that says, Dorica, who told you that you had to be a product of your circumstances? Who told you you wouldn't be able to cope? Who told you you had anything to be ashamed of? Because I felt shame. I felt the shame of now I'm not able to keep my marriage and my family together. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a cultural thing from where I'm from in Jamaica, where the woman is responsible for making the marriage work. And as a little girl, I used to hear it all the time. If a marriage failed, if a marriage didn't work out, the woman was to be blamed because it was a result of something that she did not do. So when all that happened, I, I blamed myself. I didn't do enough of this. I, didn't, I wasn't enough of that. I wasn't enough. I went into depression. I had low self-esteem. I lost my identity. I went through all of that. I, went, I was at the place of contemplating suicide at that point. So what I decided to do was I was going to just do something drastic. I was going to run away. I had this brilliant idea. I'm going to pack myself up, pack my tools up, get everything I could grab, and we're going to move someplace far where nobody knew me. Nobody knew where I was from. I was going to start over. I was going to get a new life, new identity. New home, new everything, just start brand new, start afresh. That was my big genius plan to just run away. New everything. Even if I could change my fingerprint, I was gonna do it. <laughs> I was just thinking wild out. I was out there. But I'm glad that I had people around me, family, friends, loved ones who stopped by me, who prayed for me, who helped me. Days when I couldn't get up, they helped me up. And with the help of all these people and the help of God, here I am standing, sitting rather in front of you today, doing what I'm doing now. So many things came as a result of that experience. So what lessons can you gain? You learn to forgive. 
that's one of the lessons that I had to practice over and over again, forgiveness. I learned how to forgive quicker, sooner, faster. And I realized by me forgiving, it does not release the person from what they did. It doesn't say they didn't do me wrong or they didn't do anything bad to me. Forgiveness is not for you. It's not for them. It's for you. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. When you forgive, you're giving yourself a gift of life. When you forgive, you release all kind of weight, evidence, stress, tension, and it opens you up for joy, happiness, and peace. It's an important strategy. And, and it's so important that this is also a leadership strategy. I have a leadership training coming up on August 18, and I'm teaching these things in my leadership strategies. These are people who are leaders. They run organizations, small and large. They lead teams of people. But these are also life lessons that leaders need to learn. I'm teaching how to deal with pain and how to, to, to transition and how to, to, to use pain to grow themselves and their business. Forgiveness is a, a part of being a leader, an effective leader. Build is a part of your character, good character. I'm teaching this. So it's a part of us as people to forgive. We need to learn to forgive. You also learn to develop faith while you're going through your grief. You develop faith in God because at some point you're going to have to trust God that this is going to work for my good. This is going to work out. This is not the end. So you develop that faith in God, especially if you've gotten a promise or especially if you're believing for something or especially if you've been told you were here to do something great. You hold on to that faith and you believe that it's going to work out. And that's what I had to do. I had to hold on to the faith that he said to me, you are born for greatness. You're created for more. There's more than I have in store for you. I had to hold on and develop my faith in God. And you know, Hebrews, Hebrews 11 tells us without, I think it's Hebrews 11, 6 to be exact, says without faith, is, yeah, it's right there. Hebrews 11, 6 says without faith, it's impossible to please God. You have to have faith in God. So you learn to build your faith during these moments. You also, through pain, you develop patience. I know patience is not really a virtue that most people strive to get, but it's something that you will need as you go through life. You need to develop patience. Patience is a good leadership skill set, character, quality as well. Because when you have patience, you know that when something happens, it's just a matter of time. You're not going to make a rash decision that's going to affect you and your business and your family. You're not going to allow what's happening to dictate or take you off course. You have exercise patience. And James 1, 4 and 8 talks about that, that patience needs to have its perfect work. Patience take time. It's going to take time to get through this. It's going to take time to heal. It's going to take time to overcome it. It's going to take time. The lessons you're going to learn may take time, but these are lessons that we can all pick up the nuggets, the gold, the diamonds, all these things, all those precious jewels. If you think about them, the diamonds, the, 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 the rubies, the pearls, these are all precious jewels that come forth through pain, through hardship, through a process. It's a part of the process. Right. And when patients have its perfect work and it's complete, then you will be perfect as a person lacking nothing. Not perfect in the sense that you won't mess up, but your perfect being, your, the essence of who you are is perfect, lacking, lacking nothing. You're more effective in that way, effective in every area of your life. These are the lessons that we can learn. And these are the lessons that I had to really sit down and write down because these were lessons I was learning along the way back in 2015. And it's through my experience back in 2015 when I was homeless, depressed, I was separated, I didn't know what to do, where to go. That's the time when I even developed other skill sets. I became certified by John Maxwell as a speaker to train and speak on his, his leadership skills and his resources. I became a speaker of my own company where I would speak on my experiences and speak on what I've learned. It was through that experience that I went through that I discovered my purpose, why I was here. You discover your purpose. What am I here to do, God? Through that, I experience that discovery. Pain helps us to grow, to stretch. And if we don't stretch, then we can't get to the next level. When you go through pain, it's stretching you. It's putting in you the things that you need to move forward, to move to the next level, to be that help, that rescue for somebody else who may need it because somebody will need it. Somebody else will need you at some point in time. And you stretch, you build that capacity that you need to be that person to somebody else, or even for, for yourself at some point. You stretch, you grow. 
we have to grow and a stretch. When you go through pain, it helps you to shift your paradigm. I spoke about my mindset. I spoke about the fact that I was depressed and I couldn't see myself without my, my marriage or my family. But I had to shift my mindset because the loss, I had lost so much of my identity in my marriage that when, it's, when, it, when it ended, or not even when it ended, when we separated, I didn't know who I was. I had to go back to go to God and say, okay, who am I? Because I don't know who I am. You are the one who created me. Who am I? mind and when i went into asking god in the presence of god reading the word of god and i begin to find out who i was that's when i begin to realize okay i'm not defined by my experience in my marriage my marriage does not define me my kids do not define me the title that i wore as a mother as a wife as a leader as a as a student as an employee none of those things define me because when they're all gone and taken away from me i'm still me the real me is still here so i had to shift my mindset discover my identity who i was and then from there be able to move forward i had a decision to make i could choose to stay stuck in depression and sadness and all those things or i can choose to live and i chose life i chose to live i chose that i wanted to live for my kids i have two young girls that i wanted to live for i have so much that i discovered now that was in me that i wanted to put birth out and i wanted to push out from that decision came forth my eight weeks speak uh, my eight weeks coaching session on get unstuck discover your purpose overcome limiting beliefs and discover what you really should be doing with your life i was able to create that that vision right from this experience my eight week one-on-one -on -one coaching on how to get unstuck overcome limiting beliefs and discover what you really should be doing with your life so you can live a life on purpose that benjamin mentioned in my introductory that's how that session that's how that came from Craig came forth from all this i need to give you your 10 minute warning okay thank you right so all of the things that we go through all the grief all the pain all the hurt all of this is working together for our good if we can just shift our focus shift our mindset from um what is happening to me to okay what can i learn from this how can i gain from this how can i be better from this how can i grow from this how can i um change from this how can i help somebody from this how? and you'd be surprised how many people i've met since then so many opportunities i've had to to encourage somebody else who was going through something similar to bring the lessons i've learned through my hurt through my grief through my pain to somebody else who was going through something different but they experienced the whole thing of pain and I could say, okay, this is what was, I've done. This is what has helped me. Here you go. It can help you. I've had the pleasure of, of speaking in 2017 about dealing with rejection because rejection also one of the emotions I felt during this period and overcoming that. And I had the pleasure of speaking into the lives of young ladies and men who were dealing with rejection. And at the end, see them come and hug me and we cried together because I know the pain of what they're going through. I've been there. This is all a part of the human experience. It's all a part of what makes us one human beings together in this. Okay. All right. So um, that's it. Again, I'm going to open up the floor to some Q&A. This is a time you can unmute yourself, ask the questions. The questions you have, go ahead and ask them so we can Jump right in. I will do my best to um, unmute anybody so that they can speak up if they want, but it looks like I may have to read some of these questions from the Whova app and I, I would encourage you to type them in. So let me, um, let me uh, read some of these to you so that we can talk about it. Um, okay. Here's one from Vicki Chris, um, Christian. Prayer is huge for me when I'm experiencing grief. Writing my way through it also helps. So that's that's an interesting little insight. Do you want, have anything to say about that? Yes, Vicky, and I, that's one of the things that helped me too: journaling, writing, and prayer. To this very day, every morning I get up, I have a routine. It's become now my ritual, so to speak. One hour, I have my devotion. In that devotion, I pray, I speak, and then I meditate, listen to God. So prayer is you talking to God when you meditate. Now you be quiet, silent, and you listen. So I do that as a part of my everyday routine and it helps me even to this day to, to do those things and to journal every day. And I, and I never leave home without it. Here's my journal. 
here's my pen. I write all the time because thoughts just come. And that's a good practice to have and keep, keep, keep doing it. I encourage you to keep doing it. I encourage you to keep, if it works, keep working it. So that's a, a great strategy. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Um, we have some other questions here that are really about the fact that grief doesn't seem to end in some cases, that it's so difficult. It's not something you can just get over. Uh, here's another one. It says, I've been divorced and I've been widowed. Divorce is ugly, but I got over it. I will never get over losing my husband and children. Wow. What can you say to, to that kind of concern? Let me just first say this. By you reading that to me, I felt it in here. I felt that pain because I know what it feels like to lose something that you hold dear, something that you lost. Um, I'm never ever going to tell you that you are going to get over the loss because if there, if you've, there, there's a connection there. There's an emotional connection. You share time and space with this person, right? What you're going to have to do, and this is what I'm doing, is yes, you get over the grief because grief if, is not healthy. So we have to get past that negative emotion of grief. We deal with it, of course, and we go through the process and the time that it takes to heal because it's a healing that needs to happen so you can be whole. But you are never going to, when you think about the, the loved ones you've lost, you think of them from a, a place of joy and peace and wholeness and happiness. Like you cherish the moments and the times that you share. You focus on the good times. You focus on the, the quality moments. You focus on those experiences that you had with this person because they did happen. You're not going to forget, forget, ever forget them because it did exist. But now you just have to look at it from a place of, I'm just so happy that this, I had an experience. I'm so happy that this happened. I'm so happy that I can look at this now and just not feel the pain of losing, but, but think about the joy of what we shared together at the moment that we shared it together. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I've got a couple more along those lines. Okay. Um, what can you say to help me? I don't feel like I've gained anything from grief. I feel diminished by it permanently. I've never overcome anything deeply painful. It just feels as raw and horrible even years later as it did at first. Wow. That's a very loaded question and that's a powerful question. I know how you feel because in 2015, when my husband decided he wanted to walk away and leave, didn't want to be married anymore, I went through a three or four month period of grief where I was walking, smiling outside of my house, going to work, smiling, but I was inside, I was deeply sad and depressed. And I remember, and I describe it this way because that's the only, only way I can describe it. I remember every time I looked up and I mean, looked up, not physically look up, but look up within myself. All I saw was gloom. I felt like I was in a tunnel, dark tunnel that was stuck. And I could never get to the end of the tunnel. That's how I felt every time. And the first thing you have to do, and this is the first thing I have to do, do not define one, don't, don't define your life by that one experience. That was one experience. It was a moment in time. Don't get stuck in the moment. And the way we get stuck in the moment is by focusing on what we lost. In every, we, we live in a duality world where there's good and bad, right? So if you lost something, you also gain something. Shift your mindset, shift your focus from what you lost to, okay, what have I gained? What have I learned? I gave you some examples of what I learned. I learned to forgive during my, my moments. I didn't know how to forgive. It was easy for me to, to have somebody up to, to harbor anger in my heart. I learned to forgive. And with the gift of forgiveness, I found joy and peace and release. I also learned to build my faith. I also learned the strength that I have. I didn't know how strong I was until I went through that. When I went through it and I didn't die, I realized, oh my God, Dorica, you are stronger than you think. There's so much to gain from grief. There's so much to gain from any lesson you learn or anything that happens to you. You just have to shift your mindset, which is a paradigm. The paradigm is a, is a set of beliefs that you hold. Your life didn't end. It didn't define you. It does not define you. It was a moment, one moment. Do not let it define your entire life experience. Shift that. Focus on the good. Focus on what you now have, what you can do with it. You may have birthed something for it, like I did. I birthed my speaking and coaching business from my painful experience. 
I'm writing a book about it. I have eight week coaching session, how to help people get unstuck from that. I have all those things that came from it. There's so much you can get from this. Shift your mindset. That's the first step. Shift it. Shift your mindset. I, I see that as a really, really powerful thing. What I hear you saying is that grief is an experience, not an identity. Right. It's something that happened to you. It's not who you are. Right. right. And it's, why, it's, it's a moment. It's an instant. That's, like, that's beautiful. I, Dorica, I want to thank you for your leadership and your wisdom and your insight uh, sharing with us today, but we are out of time. And so oh. I need to end the session. Okay, I appreciate it. And for the questions I didn't get to answer, I'm going to be on Rovia, guys. I'm going to check on it. I'm going to answer the questions, okay? Thank you so much for being here and tuning in with me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay.